Hello, my friends of the Psychedelic Renaissance. It's Tom Hatzis, your psychedelic historian, and this is Magical Plants, Henbane. Before we dig into this truly witchy plant, please subscribe to my YouTube page if you're into this kind of content, and make sure you hit that little bell icon so that you're notified every time I post a new video. Also, it would be great to see you on Instagram. Please find me at Psychedelic Historian, and we do have a private Facebook Sanctum Psychedelia group where we talk about all things wild and weird. We'd love to have you join that conversation. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. First, and most importantly, how cool is this new chair? <laughs> Could you believe somebody threw this out? Good for me. One particular family of psychoactives that have totally fallen out of favor today, but were once widely used in both the ancient and medieval worlds, are those of the Solanachia variety. Plants like mandrake, belladonna, and henbane. Now, I'll be making videos on all of those plants and several others, but for now, I'd like to focus just on one, henbane, and show how ancient and medieval peoples used it for medicine, in magic, for recreation, and for spiritual, or we might say, entheogenic or otherwise, experiences. But first, a little chemistry. The roots, stems, and leaves of henbane contain psychoactive alkaloids like hyoscyamine, scopolamine, atropine, and tropane. In small doses, around a gram or so, henbane causes an intoxicating sort of drunk-like effect. In slightly higher doses, around 2 grams, 2.5 grams, a person will experience more hypnotic effects, delirium, and visionary and somewhat mild psychedelic effects. And in higher doses, around an eighth or so, you're looking at muscle spasms, coma, and death. So, be warned, henbane is not a plant to be used flippantly. And now, a little history. The earliest textual evidence we have for henbane comes from the Sanskrit word aj amoda, which means goat's joy, a sort of allusion to the plant's intoxicating properties. Later on, henbane was known as jus chamus in Latin, which itself is derived from two Greek words, hus meaning pig, and quamos meaning bean, so hog bean. However, the Romans also called it herba apollinatus after Apollo, the Greek god of music, intellectual pursuits, and, most telling for our purposes, prophecy. After the fall of Rome, the earliest textual evidence we have for henbane comes from Isidore of Sabia in his Etymologiae, written around the early 7th century of the Common Era, wherein he describes the mind-altering properties of that plant. In Etymologiae, Isidore references henbane by two different names. Herba insana, or the insane herb, is what educated people called it. However, commoners refer to it as melamindrum, which I think is pretty interesting. Why is that interesting? Glad you asked. It's interesting because commoners, by and large, did not read Latin, which was the lingua franca of the educated class. And yet, melamindrum derives from two Latin words, mille, meaning a thousand, and mentis, meaning minds. So, a thousand minds, which seems to me to be an obvious reference to henbane's mind-altering properties. Some intriguing evidence we have for henbane comes from the burial site of a woman who was interred at Firket Castle in Denmark. While the dating of the grave is unknown, we do know that this woman was a Viking, a culture that lasted from between around 800 of the Common Era to 1100 of the Common Era. She seems to have been a woman of fairly high status, and has even been dubbed a seer or a prophet by the National Museum of Denmark based on her burial possessions, which includes silver pendants, silver toe rings, bronze bowls, and a tire stitched with golden thread. She was also found with what appears to be a magic wand and a satchel filled with henbane seeds. Unfortunately, we don't exactly know what it was that she was using those henbane seeds for. Sure, she could have uh, lit them on fire and inhaled them and used that to prophecy, but we can't really rule that in any more than we can rule it out. However, there are other instances where we know exactly what a person was using henbane for. For example, Burkhard of Worms' Corrector, written around 1010 of the Common Era, tells of a local German custom. During droughty seasons, a young girl would strip nude. 
Then she and some of the other girls would leave the village in search of wild henbane, which they called Belisa. The nude girl had to dig up the henbane roots and all using her right hand only and then tie it to the pinky toe of her right foot. The other girls would then lead the nude girl with the henbane tied to her foot to a nearby river and splash her with sticks. Then the entire group of them had to return to the village by walking backwards. This ritual apparently would make the rains come. This particular custom did not include eating or ingesting in any way the henbane for its magical effects. However, there were other instances where to get the magical effects of henbane, you absolutely had to ingest it. Like all solanaceous plants, henbane in high doses can cause delirium and psychotic episodes and even death. But because of that, because of how unstable henbane was, we get this crude window of how medieval people recognized dose, set, and setting. Let me unpack that by moving on from the purely superstitious rituals like the rain ritual to how henbane was actually used in medical magic. First with dose. Like I just mentioned, henbane is deadly in high doses. Therefore, the healer or wise woman would have to be knowledgeable in proper dose sizes so as to not kill the patient. Second, both the wise woman or healer and the patient, in fact most people, all lived within this set of a magical worldview. And finally, the setting for magical medicinal rites were really quite involved. Let's take a look at an example that meets all three criteria called Bald's Leech Book, which is a magical medical text written around the 9th century. Here we find a henbane ointment used for protection against the elven race, nocturnal goblin visitors, and for the women with whom the devil hath carnal commerce. This ointment should be placed under an altar, and the healer or wise woman would then sing nine masses over it. The ointment would then be applied to the patient, and the healer would make the sign of the cross over them as they drifted off into that dreamy trance state caused by the henbane. I find it difficult to maintain that the patient wouldn't have some kind of otherworldly or, dare I say, entheogenic-like experience with all of those prompts in place. I mean, we have a psychoactive medicine, magical religious medical rituals, and an almost shamanic-like healer guiding them through the process. Other times, henbane was to be mixed with holy water and drunk from a church bell. It was exactly these kinds of magical practices that common people fused with Christianity that drove church authorities absolutely crazy. In more learned medical treatises, like Santus Ardaini's Opus de Venenus, the author speaks of henbane causing both drunkenness and synesthesia. Now, this latter term was defined by the LSD researcher Sidney Cohen as crossovers of sensation from one sense modality to another. For example, the subject will say that they can hear colors or speak of the scent of music. The Latin term for this kind of phenomenon caused by henbane, and actually all solanaceous plants, is permistionis rationis, which translates to a mixing of the senses. This state of mind was desirable for recreational purposes. Remember earlier when I said some Germans refer to henbane as belisa? Well, sometimes belisa was bilzen, from which we get the word pilsnerkraut. In fact, the word pilsnerkraut simply means henbane herb, and a pilsner is just a linguistic holdover from when we used to put henbane in beers, much the same way that Coca-Cola is a linguistic holdover from when we used to put cocaine in that soda. That state of mind was also desirable for more pythiogenic, meaning generating magic with psychoactives, ways of ingesting henbane. As I mentioned in my last video, Medieval Christians and Psychedelics, the Renaissance magician Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa von Nettesheim used to inhale henbane because it would make spirits forthwith appear in the air and elsewhere. In fact, Agrippa referred to henbane, and opium for that matter, as spirits herbs for exactly that reason. We also know that, for that same reason, henbane was added to some early modern transvection ointments, 
commonly today referred to as flying ointments or lamiatum unguentum, the witch's ointment. The mid-16th century physician, Johann Weyer, writes in his treatise, Di Prestigis Daemonum et et Cantantionibus et Veneficis, which translates to, On the Tricks of Demons, Enchanters, and Drug Magicians, hint, hint, of an ointment made of henbane, hemlock, deadly nightshade, and opium. And so, some wise women would use an ointment somewhat like this specifically for its soporific and visionary effects, which I call somnotheogenic, meaning to generate divinity in dreams. In fact, some early modern demonologists, like Jean Vincent, had their own word for this, which was soporatum, meaning fantastically lucid dreams that seem real. Sadly, we don't know much about what this experience was really like, because many of the records came from demonologists who were all too eager to paint the experience in ghastly and satanic terms. Although, some early sources, like the 14th century sermon written by Pierre Baris, who was a Benedictine monk, and the 15th century treatise De Schismate, or On the Papal Schism, written by the Dutch historian Dietrich of Nîmes, reference a kind of mountaintop overseen by a goddess as the destination for this kind of trip. Other times, like the Canon Episcopi, written in 906 of the Common Era, we hear about women riding on animals in the company of this goddess. I'll be making a whole video on this topic. But for now, we can get a feel for where it's going by turning to an account from a German toxicologist named Gustav Schenk, who inhaled henbane and recorded this of his experience. There were animals which looked at me keenly with contorted grimaces and staring terrified eyes. There were flying stones and clouds of mist, all sweeping along in the same direction. They carried me irresistibly with them. They were enveloped in a vague gray light, which emitted a dull glow and rolled onwards and upwards into a black and smoky sky. Above my head, water was flowing, dark and blood red. The sky was filled with a whole herd of animals. Fluid, formless creatures emerged from the darkness. I heard words, but they were all wrong and nonsensical, and yet they possessed for me some hidden meaning. I know that I trembled in horror, but I also know that I was permeated by a peculiar sense of well-being, connected with the crazy sensation that my feet were growing lighter. I was seized with the fear that I was falling apart. At the same time, I experienced an intoxicating sensation of flying. Well, my friends, that's all I have for you this time, and like always, I'd love to thank you for stopping by. Please like and share this video, and if you're into this kind of content, subscribe to my Psychedelic Historian YouTube page. Also, I do hope to see you on Instagram and in our secret Sanctum Psychedelia Facebook group. Finally, if you're interested in learning more about these kinds of medieval, psychoactive, or psychedelic, or entheogenic, or call them what you will experiences, please check out my books, The Witch's Ointment, and Psychedelic Mystery Traditions. And until next time, I'm Tom Hatzis, your psychedelic historian, reminding you that you free your mind by using your brain. Peace.